So recall the notion of the cycloid that we had introduced before. So if a if a cartwheel is spinning and a fixed point on that circle is determined, what path does it trace throughout space? Uh, you can see that path right here, uh, illustrated in green. It makes these arches over and over and over again. We had saw previously that we can parameterize the cycloid using the equations x equals r times theta minus sine theta and y equals r times 1 minus cosine theta. So theta is our parameter here in play. And so what I want to do is do some type of uh, curve sketching analysis uh, of the cycloid using, uh, using this parameterization, right? So can we find the tangent line of the cycloid at the point pi equals, or sorry, theta equals pi thirds? So at the parameter pi thirds, what would the tangent line look like? Uh, and so we first begin by computing the derivative. Remember y prime, which is just shorthand for dy over dx. This is equal to dy over dt, or I guess in this case it would be theta, divided by dx over d theta. So taking the derivatives here, the derivative of y with respect to theta, we're going to treat r as a constant. The radius of the circle doesn't change throughout this problem. We're going to get... Um, r times the derivative of 1 is 0, the derivative, so that just would disappear, the derivative of negative cosine would be a positive sign. So you're going to get an r sine theta on top. For the denominator, you're going to get r times the derivative of theta is 1, and the derivative of negative sine would be a negative cosine. So you're going to get 1 minus cosine theta for x on the bottom. The r's cancel out, in which case you get y prime is sine theta over just one minus cosine theta. So then if we evaluate y prime at pi thirds, we're gonna plug in pi thirds in here, we get sine of pi thirds, and then one minus cosine of pi thirds. Uh, sine of pi thirds, that's gonna be root two, or sorry, root three over two. Plug that in right here, root three over two. For cosine, it's just a one half. So 1 minus 1 half, is, of course, is 1 half. And then simplifying this, this compounded fraction here, we get root 3 over 2 times by the reciprocal 2 over 1. 2 over 1, the 2's cancel, and we just get the square root of 3. That is the slope of the tangent line at that point. So the equation of the tangent line will look like y minus k, the, the y-coordinate at the point of tangency, uh, so we should actually, we could write this as um, our function g at pi thirds, right? So if this function right here is our g of theta, and this one right here is our f of theta. So we have to compute y minus g of pi thirds. This is equal to y prime at pi thirds times x minus f at pi thirds. Some of these we already know, of course. Uh, so the derivative is going to be the square root of 3 times x. If we plug in, if we plug in pi thirds into the function g, uh, that's one, this one right here, you'll end up with cosine of pi thirds, as we saw before. Um, that's, a, that's a 1 half. 1 minus 1 half is 1 half. So you're going to get r halves over there. Y, y minus r halves like so. And then for the x-coordinate, we have to pop, put pi thirds into this guy over here. Uh, sine of pi thirds is root 3 over 2. Theta will just be pi thirds. So you're going to get minus r times pi thirds minus root 3 over 2. That's a delicious irrational number. And this right here would give us the equation of the tangent line. Now, if you don't like this because it's not in slope intercept form, then of course you solve for y and you end up with y equals uh, square root of 3 times x minus r times pi over the square root of 3 minus 2. Is that right? That seems a little bit funky. How did the square root of 3 get in the bottom there? Uh, I think I must have distributed something. Oh, yeah, that's because when you distribute the square root of 3 onto this part, square root of 3 on top can simplify with the square root of three, the three on bottom, get the square root of three on the bottom. So no, that's legit. That is the real deal, everyone. 
Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, you know, we could approximate it, but that's, that's what the tainted line would look like, or the equation of it, and we could draw it above. Um, working on ones that's a little bit easier, what if we looked for horizontal and vertical tangent lines? Uh, like we mentioned before, the horizontal tangent lines will coincide when dy over dx is equal to zero. That'll happen when dy over d theta equals zero. And likewise, the vertical tangent lines will be when there's a zero in the denominator of dy over dx, aka dx over d theta equals zero. So using the derivatives that we had calculated before, so dy over dt, remember this is equal to r sine theta from above. We want that to equal zero. And for the vertical tangents, we have to take dx over dt, set that equal to zero. That was an r times one minus cosine theta. We want that to equal zero. And so we'll work with the horizontal tangent lines first. Uh, <clears throat> divide both sides by r, we get sine theta equals zero. And so when is sine equal to zero? That would happen when sine is zero. It happens at pi. It happens at two pi. It happens at three pi, or more specifically, uh, this will happen at k multiples of pi. Because this also include negative numbers as well. All right. Uh, let's see. Make sure I wrote that down correctly. Um, we have our sign right there. And then for the other one, if we have r times one minus cosine theta, that should equal zero. Divide both sides by r, we get one minus cosine theta is equal to zero. Uh, so we wanna know when cosine theta is equal to one. When is cosine theta equal one? Uh, that occurs when thinking about our unit circle, cosine starts off at one. Uh, and that then cosine theta it starts off at one, so you get zero pi, two pi. No, I take that back. Cosine, cosine is equal to one, not at negative pi, but at two pi and four pi. So you get things like that. So when theta is a multiple of two pi, so two pi k, that's when you will get vertical lines. I see. Um, I guess I guess the issue that I forgot to mention earlier is that when we're looking for a horizontal and vertical tangent, we want the we need the numerator to be zero, but we also need that dx over d theta is not zero. They can't both simultaneously be zero. All right, um, and then to find a vertical tangent, we have to investigate. Well, when we want the denominator to be zero, but the numerator not to be zero. Right, And so there's actually a little bit of a mix up right here. The denominator will be zero at multiples of two pi. The numerator, the numerator will be zero like we said before. Uh, so when we, when, we, when we set r sine theta equal to zero, we got multiples of pi, right? And so this is any multiple pi, so this is this is even or odd multiple pi's. So in particular, there's an overlap, right? We're gonna get something that looks like zero over zero at even, at even multiples. Even multiples, you know, these two pi k that we saw over here. So, I mean, this k pi, it could be broken up into two pieces. There's gonna be odd multiples. So we get things like uh, two n minus one times pi versus just two n pi, like so. And so these ones are, per, are per completely kosher, right? So because there's no overlap right here, these ones will definitely be horizontal tangent lines in that situation. But what happens at the even multiples of pi? It turns out that a L'Hopital argument is gonna be necessary for this situation. So we're looking at the limit as say, theta approaches an even multiple of pi right? It's going to approach an even multiple of pi. We're going to take then sine theta on top. 
and then one minus cosine theta on the bottom because the R's cancel out this time. And so again, if you just plug in two n pi, you're gonna end up with zero over zero. So by L'Hopital's rule, we take the derivative on top and bottom. We're gonna take the limit now. Uh, we're going to get cosine on top and then we get sine on bottom. Again, now we're approaching still two n pi, an even multiple of pi. On the top, we will end up with a one. On the bottom, we get zero. And so one over zero here represents we have some type of uh, vertical asymptote. Really what this is describing here is that the zero in the bottom wins the fight. And so it turns out that for even multiples of pi, there aren't horizontal asymptotes, not horizontal tangents. They're actually vertical tangent lines. And so we come back up to our graph. This actually matches up with what we see, that if we look at odd multiples of pi, so we take pi, 3 pi, negative pi, we end up with horizontal tangent lines on our cycloid. And when we take even multiples of pi, like 2 pi and 0, we actually get vertical tangent lines. So again, using our curve sketching type analysis we learned in Calculus 1, we can use the derivative to analyze parametric functions such as the cycloid, which be aware the cycloid, you look at this thing, it passes the vertical line test. We could describe this function using y equals a function of x. It's just, if you're, if you're daring enough, go look it up online sometime. It is a beast. It's very difficult to use. This parameterization that you see on the screen right here is much, much more natural to use, but you have to be used to doing calculus with parametric functions. How would we be able to find these tangent lines like we did here? We could do it. We could also identify and show that this graph is always concave down by taking the second derivative and showing that it's always positive. I won't, I won't do that right now, but I'll challenge you that you should try to do that um, after this video is over. And this is gonna conclude lecture 30 for us in our series. Um, in the next video, we're gonna talk a little bit about how integration is affected when we work with parametric curves. So stay tuned for that one.